Right, Eric Knoll, you're in London. You witnessed this stuff happening. How surprised are you by the kinds of allegations that prosecutors are making against this lone gentleman? This, this, I won't call him a rogue because he wasn't working for anybody. He was working for himself. Oh, well, thank you, Eric, for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, what I would say about it is, is I think there was always a suspicion that there were bad actors during the flash crash. So as far back as 2010, I think the CFTC indicated that they were examining some of the trading because some of the quoting behavior that people saw there. Uh, the allegations against this individual, I think, come to a surprise to many of us in the industry because he was uh, essentially a lone wolf, someone that no one had uh, dealt with before or understood before. Uh, so finding out about it now is, uh, is quite interesting uh, five years after the fact. But what does it say about the integrity of the U.S. equity market that this guy, who is now 36 and clearly was a few years younger on, in May of 2010 when the flash crash took place, that somebody uh, acting alone without apparently uh, much sophisticated, much of a sophisticated background in trading uh, for any of the well-known firms could cause this kind of disruption. Raises questions about who else might be doing it today. Well, I think those are legitimate questions, like how, how is someone like this able to do these things in the, in the markets? I, I, but I do want to make a couple of points around that. One is, is that this was not the equity markets, even though the equity markets experienced the flash crash. This was an incident that occurred in the futures market, mm -hmm. which then dr ended up driving equity prices. Um, but also the industry learned a lot coming out of the flash crash and put a lot of safeguards into place to prevent just these kinds of behaviors. So new market-wide circuit breakers, limit up, limit down on individual securities, uh, pre-trade market access rules for market participants to prevent rogue algorithms from entering the market. So a lot of, a lot of lessons that were learned coming out of the flash trash, crash have been put into place now as we go forward. Carrie, explain to us exactly what he did. So he did what's called spoofing, which became illegal when Dodd-Frank was passed and President Obama signed it in 2010, where essentially you flood the market with a ton of orders on any given security with the intent to cancel those. And in doing that, it artificially drives the price of that security either up or down. Now regulators and now criminal prosecutors consider this a form of market manipulation. And this is the only the second criminal case with spoofing charges that we've had since Dodd-Frank was passed. Last year we had Michael Costco who was indicted on six spoofing charges in Chicago and now we have this case. But I think going back to your original question, Eric, one of the interesting things is why no, did it take... we're answering my questions now. <laughs> but why did it take them five years to figure this out? And the guy kept trading up until a year ago doing all the same stuff. So those are the questions that the regulators and the stock exchange and the futures exchanges are going to have to answer is how did all this volume keep flowing through even after they put all those safeguards in after the flash Eric, crash? what do you think about that? Well, I, I think, that, again, I'm not sure in the specific instances of this trader. I haven't read the indictment, and, I, and there are obviously serious charges, and I look forward to you know, hearing more about them. But I think some of the issues, again, that, that the industry is trying to resolve for itself are the, the stock exchanges and the SEC are putting into place something on the consolidated audit trail, which will provide all of the data of all the trading back to the regulators so that they'll have more of a real-time view and picture of what's happening in the marketplace. Um, but I think there are some legitimate questions to answer here as to, like, how did this single person uh, have this access to the marketplace and why did it take that long to find well, it? Well, but as far as the taking that long to find it, on the one hand, we want to give, if not credit, right, prosecutors the, the, the leeway they need to be able to build a bulletproof case. Absolutely. On and the other hand, even before it becomes case. a criminal case, how, how does the, the market, you know, the, the sort of the operations that oversee the market, what room do they have to step in and stop these kinds of things happening? And I, I think that's where you have the delay in action yeah, happening. So we have point. a market structure issue with the regulators and how they're responding. And then criminal prosecutors then have to go through an incredibly yes. technical... Clear a very act, high bar, too. Very high bar to get a case like this cleared, you know, to indictment. So how, you know, and they work completely separately. Obviously, prosecutors cannot regulate the market, and they cannot be responsible for market structure. Eric, should the, C should the CME itself have some kind I, I, I'm not familiar enough with the structure of the futures market I know a little bit more about the structure of the equity market but based on what you know is there a self-regulatory or policing role for an organization like the CME to play here 
Well, the CME and the National Futures Association take responsibility as self-regulatory organizations for the future side of the business. So again, I don't have enough facts here to make a judgment or to know what they were doing uh, or examining this uh, or, or really uh, whether whether this gentleman's activity rises to the level of criminal activity. Remember that he's just no, been no, indicted. No, no, even if it doesn't, it's a confidence right. issue. And we've been wrestling this ever since the flash crash and for that matter before, ever since the meltdown in U.S. equity markets in the wake of the financial crisis. Investors, look at the trading volumes. They're coming back, but it's taken years. People are still afraid. And when they, when they open up Bloomberg.com or when they happen to open up the newspaper or listen to our conversation here, they ask themselves, if this guy, if this guy can mess with the equity market to this degree and was allowed to continue trading until I think it was April of last year, what business do I have in the market? Well, I, I, again, going back to some of the very changes and lessons that we've learned, is that it's a very complex market, and we, we know that. And, and it's electronically linked to one another, and there's fragmentation, and there are lots of concerns that we're trying very hard to address as an industry. However, I think real reform has taken place, real changes have taken place. But to your earlier point about people being scared away from the equities market, of course, since the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, equities have had very, very nice returns. And so that if you have avoided That a lot of people haven't equities, enjoyed because they were afraid to trade. There you go. I know. So, this, so they've, they've missed out on that because I do think if you look at the, the history of what's happened here, the equity markets actually work very well. There are changes, there are reforms, there are necessary things that we have to consider and continue doing, and some have already been taken. But I do think that the markets generally work very, very well for price discovery and liquidity.